theory is terribly important because eventually we've got to develop quantitative ways of encapsulating what we've observed and understanding how the plasma is actually doing what it's doing. And that's really what we've been developing for the last 50 or 60 years is, is the whole science of plasma physics, as it's called. Now, plasma physics itself is a fascinating subfield of physics. It's important for fusion, and that's where a lot of the effort in it has come from, but it's also vital for understanding the rest of the universe because uh, a high fraction of what we can see at any rate in the universe is in fact in the plasma state. And the phenomena that we've been developing an understanding for are just as important in astrophysics and space physics as they are for fusion energy. are very excited to talk to you because you have a handle on something that is central to the understanding of what it means to actually harness the power of the atom. There's very few people that have access to this knowledge, and you are one of them. Yes, I, I am a professor of nuclear science and engineering at MIT. Um, our department really uh, is the focus uh, place for the study of fission power, which is the nuclear power that we currently have in our societies. And my own research has uh, focused for more than 40 years on the study of uh, nuclear fusion as a possible future energy source for humankind, which is the challenge of bringing the energy source of the stars down to the human level and deploying it for our benefit. Are you optimistic about the prospects? Well, for fission, we have it already. So, okay. Sure. <laughs> uh, I'm certainly optimistic about that. I think there are challenges for uh, fission. Fission, by the way, of course, is, is means taking heavy elements like uranium, breaking them up, and that releases large amounts of nuclear energy, which we can use to power turbines, generate electricity, or even drive submarines and that kind of thing. Um, so that's fission. And then we know that works. Uh, there, it has... It has some challenges. It has uh, challenges concerning acceptance by the public, um, but, it, but it is an energy source which is almost completely non-emitting of carbon, and, and it produces very little waste. Um, that waste is fairly unpleasant and needs to be sequestered, um, but, uh, but it's, in my view, a very clean source of energy. Fusion uh, it, the process of fusion is the opposite. It means taking light elements, uh, nu uh, nucleons, and fusing them together to get heavier elements, hydrogen into helium and so forth. And that is how the stars are powered. That's the predominant energy source of essentially all the stars, um, different types of fusion reaction. And fusion uh, takes place at very high temperatures. In the center of the stars, it's fairly hot. Um, you know, maybe 10 or 20 uh, million degrees Celsius. Actually, to get fusion to work on Earth, we need to, be, we need to create um, a, a high density, relatively high density uh, gas in which the temperatures are even higher than that, uh, maybe as, as high as 100 million degrees centigrade. And, and that's required in order to get these fusion reactions to take place. And it's over the last 50 years, years or so, human, humankind have been studying whether we can do that in a controlled way. Uh, fusion is, is it, it, we know fusion works uh, because we know hydrogen bombs work. Hydrogen bombs use fusion uh, to enhance their power. But we want to, be, of course, do it in a controlled way if we want to generate electricity and so forth. Um, so, the challenge has been to, to obtain controlled nuclear fusion. Your question was, how optimistic am I? Um, well, uh, it's tough um, to get those very high temperatures, to confine the plasmas, as they're called, the ionized gases at these very high temperatures it is a challenge. And uh, it's one we've been working on making progress with. 
right now, uh, as an international collaboration, a big experiment is being built in the south of France called ITER, I-T-E-R. Um, and it, it is, as I said, a seven-way international collaboration um, that, if successful, will produce um, perhaps as much as 500 megawatts of fusion reactions for hundreds of seconds at a time. So it will be an experimental demonstration of controlled fusion reactions. Uh, it won't put electricity on the grid because that's not what it's designed to do. It's an experiment. It's, it's, it's to prove that we can do it in a certain mm. sense. Um, that and, and you were one of the first people to bring a, a sort of experimental fusion reactor to outside of the Soviet Union, as I understand it, uh, s several decades back. Is, is that correct? Yeah, when I was a graduate student uh, in Australia, I worked on a device which operated like a tokamak. A tokamak is the, it was a, um, a Soviet invention uh, in in the 1950s, um, and it just it's just a name that refers to the fact that the device is toroidal. That is, it's donut shaped. There's a hole down the middle, and the, and the plasma itself, the confined hot gas, the plasma is um, is toroidal. And um, this device that I worked on as a graduate student in Australia um, basically was a tokamak. And, and it was the first tokamak to operate outside of Soviet Russia. Um, so yeah, that's kind of a claim to fame. Um, and and so how, I, oh, sorry. Well, how, how much of the design of these reactors was based on the initial understanding of the way that stars do this in nature? Hmm. Um, well, the underlying nuclear reactions um, are very similar to what goes on in stars, but stars can find their plasma in a totally different way. Stars can find their plasma using gravity. Um, and that's, um, that's a, a, a rather weak force, but it becomes strong, strong enough to confine the plasma if you make the object large enough, the mm. size of a star. Okay, gravity becomes strong, strong enough to hold it together. The reason why fusion is a challenge for us on Earth is, of course, we can't have a fusion reactor the size of a star, so we can't use gravity. That's why we have to use other stronger forces. Now, in the case of what I've been um, studying, magnetic fields uh, to confine the plasma. So, um, yes, knowing what goes on in stars informed the early pioneers of fusion uh, research about what was going to be necessary, but it didn't really tell them how to do it um, because we knew from the get-go that gravity wasn't going to be the answer. Mm. And how much has this approach changed over the years since you were working on this early uh, tokamak derivative and, and so on and up to this present uh, experiment that's being designed, uh, this large-scale experiment? Yeah. Well, ITER is a, still a tokamak, mm. uh, generically, but it's a very different tokamak from the early tokamaks that were op operating in the Soviet Union and, and the one that I originally worked on many decades ago. Um, for one thing, we now don't just accept that it's a donut of circular cross-section like this. Um, we have strong shaping of the cross-section of the plasma and it turns out this improves stability so we elongate it vertically hmm. predominantly this has strong uh, improvements in terms of the, the stability and the confinement properties um, the other thing that's clearly different about what we do in tokamax today is we have um, what's called a diverter which is something that controls the plasma that leaks out from this imperfect confinement that that plasma heat and particles is controlled using the diverter, and that itself is a big development. So over the decades, we have built tokamaks around the world. We the the the, the royal we. research the fusion research uh, community have built tokamaks of different sizes, different shapes, different um, aspect ratios, and so forth. And we now understand in much greater detail than was. Um, known in the 1950s and 60s, what the confinement of um, this configuration is. And that's what's enabled us 
to design ETA and have reasonable confidence that will actually do what we say it will do. And this is largely trial and error. You're, you're sort of modifying things as you go and, and seeing what works better and what works worse, I suppose. Well, it's not exactly trial and error, but it's certainly very experimental. Um, certainly for the early decades of fusion research, there was trial and error and there were and experiments, which is generally the case in, in all science, experiments are what determines what really is going on. Okay. Um, but uh, the developments that I just mentioned, the improvements of the tokamak, some of them are uh, things which were proposed on the basis of theory as an ideas for improvement, and they prove, you know, to, de to de deliver that improvement as, as was hoped for. Um, some of them are purely, um, you know, things we discovered as we by accident as we went along and did experiments. Mm. What do you think the ratio is of successes that were very intentionally calculated ahead of time versus the things that sort of in the business of building accidentally came to fruition? Uh, hard to guess. You know, certainly it's in the vicinity of 50-50, I'd say. That's fascinating. Um, so, so, but that's, that's one of the funs of science, isn't it? I mean, you discover unexpected things. So you don't, you aren't able to predict ahead of time, whatever, what is going to happen. And it's a voyage of discovery. That's certainly my attitude towards uh, the experimental side as well as, the, uh, as, and, and I mean, theory is terribly important because eventually we've got to develop quantitative ways of encapsulating what we've observed and understanding how the plasma is actually doing what it's doing. And that's really what we've been developing for the last 50 or 60 years is, is the whole science of plasma physics, as it's called. Now, plasma physics itself is a fascinating subfield of physics. It's important for fusion, and that's where a lot of the effort in it has come from. But it's also vital for understanding the rest of the universe because uh, a high fraction of what we can see at any rate in the universe is in fact in the plasma state. And the phenomena that we've been developing an understanding for are, ju are just as important in astrophysics and space physics as they are for fusion energy. So, sorry, I'm sorry, but it's probably a really good time to at least mention what a plasma, like, sort of talk about what defines a plasma, uh, you know, since it's kind of a key word here. Yeah. So, <laughs> you can think about there being um, different states of matter. And conventionally, we think of it as being solid, liquid, and gas. But folks like me who are interested in even higher temperatures that, that, um, um, than, than those which, which lead to a gas think of plasmas. And so a gas is typically a, an assembly of molecules or atoms which are neutral. You know, they might be hydrogen molecules or they might be oxygen molecules, whatever it is. If that gas gets hot enough, what happens is the atoms themselves break apart in a way in which uh, the electrons are stripped from the nuclei. When that happens, the nucleus is charged positively and the electron is charged negatively and we have a fluid or, or a gas, strictly speaking, that is made up of two, at least two types of particles, ions and electrons, and it can carry current, it responds to magnetic fields because of that fact, and, um, and that, that is what a plasma is. It's, it's basically an ionized gas mm. in, which, in which the influence of the charges on the separate particles is, is the most important thing. And as far as I understand, something that characterizes gases is a lack of structural elements. Is that also the case for plasma? Like, can you have a structured plasma? I would say the structure typically in a plasma comes from the forces that are influencing it. So, for example, as, as I was alluding to earlier, the, a magnetic field strongly influences the motion of the ions and electrons. So for example, um, when there's a magnetic field, let's say pointing in this direction, there's, the particles tend to gyrate around the field. They can move along the field one way or the other, but they don't move it across it. And that gyration is a way in which the magnetic field is coupling itself 
to the plasma. And so the structure typically of a, of a plasma comes mostly from the fields and, and magnetic fields are the most important. The electric fields are also important, but, um, but let, just thinking about the magnetic field. And of course, that's one of the reasons why we use magnetic confinement uh, to, to confine the plasmas we want to heat, um, because uh, the magnetic field prevents the, the particles from simply flowing to the walls of the container. Mm. So if we, if we make a container, this, these toroidal containers, tokamaks, um, in which the field lines are going round and round uh, the, the donut, then um, because the particles can move along the field lines, they move along the field lines, but that doesn't take them to the walls. It just brings them round and round. And they are much inhibited from moving across the field lines, which is the way they would leak to the walls. Mm. So the name of the game in magnetic confinement is to make a magnetic field configuration, which ensures that as little as possible leakage of the plasma away from the field lines takes place. And that's what we've been learning how to do. And mm. if they leak to the, to the container, it will just, it would just, you know, they're too hot, like they will disrupt the container, or is that the idea that the material is so very hot that you can't actually have a solid material that can contain it? Yes, just so. Um, when something's 100 million degrees Celsius, it, it can't be in contact with, you know, normal solids, <laughs> which are, you know, tens of degrees Celsius, um, without um, either the, the hot plasma cooling down very rapidly, or the solid into which it's con uh, in, in contact, melting or, or vaporizing or whatever. It turns out that the, the actual density of the plasma in fusion confinement is extremely low. Its pressure can be very can be quite high. Its pressure can be two or three atmospheres. But, um, but its density, that's the number of particles per unit volume, is very low, and, and the, the result is that even though um, the hot plasma may touch uh, the walls um, and, and thereby be cooled, typically, unless something goes badly wrong, we don't melt the walls. All we do is we cool the plasma that's leaking out of the fusion device. So that's basically the idea of how um, a, a future reactor would work, and certainly that kind of works in the existing machines I mean, sometimes things go wrong, in which case we do melt the walls. And, but you know, but it's sort of self, it's sort of self-contained. Like if it breaches, the the reaction will stop. And there's sort of this hope, I guess, that it's going to be safer, perhaps, than a, a traditional fission reactor. Is that is that correct? Yes, um, a fusion reactor, um, future fusion reactor, will have just a whiff of this incredibly hot gas. It'll be prob It'll include some tritium and deuterium. And uh, tritium is uh, uh, radioactive, um, not particularly pernicious because it's got a relatively short half-life. So it's, but it's important that that should not be released mm. in, a, in an accident. I think it's pretty clear that one can guarantee um, the integrity of the vacuum vessel to a high degree of control. And so the, the, the risks in, in, in a fusion react reactor of meltdown, of release of radioactive material and so forth, are far lower than the risks uh, that exist in a fission reactor. Fission reactors do pretty well on um, controlling those risks, but occasionally when something goes badly wrong, particularly if the reactor has been operating, the, the fission reactor has been operating and there's afterheat, then there can be dangers of meltdown from the persistent heat of of continuing reactions and continuing radioactivity of fission products. In fusion, there are no fission products, there are no radioactive products that are sufficiently radioactive to produce high heat. And so um, it, it is in un, it would be, let's say, um, undoubtedly much safer from that point of view than fission. And is that the sort of the motivation for developing fusion power is the fact that it's it's safer uh yes. or is it just it's, sort of a technological it's ability is it an efficiency <laughs> thing <laughs> yeah like what is the what is the push there are really four 
um, potential advantages that fusion has relative to fission. One is uh, almost inexha inexhaustible fuel resources. Um, not, not that fission is short of uranium. We've got lots of uranium in the world, but, but it wouldn't last forever, okay? Um, so we've got more resources. This question of um, safety is, which we already mentioned, is very important. And a, fish, and a fusion reactor, ra reactor would be much safer and much uh, less li liable to release radioactivity. Um, there's the issue of disposal of radioactive materials, um, exhaust products and so forth, which is you know, slightly problematic for, for fission, although we, we have technical answers for it. We don't have political answers for it. <laughs> um, but would be far easier for fusion because the radioactivity that it's produced is only activation and, and that's relatively mild compared with fission products. And fourth, it um, to do with proliferation of um, nuclear weapons. So the technologies you require to run a fission reactor are essentially the same for producing the fuel in, in many respects as they are for producing weapons material. Um, whereas for fusion, that's, that's not the case and, and fusion reactor would be far less likely to be hijacked um, in order to um, uh, generate uh, weapons material for some rogue state. So those are the four areas. But where now you did mention that you, you did mention that fusion was involved in the hydrogen bomb, but I assume it's coupled to a traditional uh, fission reaction as well. Is, is that correct? Or yeah. yeah, the the hydrogen bomb is a fission bomb with sort of a, a fusion pellet inside of it, and and it's sufficiently hard to get fusion going that. Um, Certainly, in the early days of fusion, um, the only way people knew how to do it was to uh, essentially embed it in a fission bomb, mm. which itself produces enormously high pressures and and and, uh, and temperatures sufficient to set off the, the fusion reactions. Um, so this by kind itself, of we don't know how to produce. We, we, there is no such thing as a fusion, a pure fusion bomb. Let's put it like that. So this kind of leads to the question of, you know, you said that there are technological abilities to deal with the waste, but not the political ability to deal with the waste. And over the course of the last 50 years or so, there's there's been a great decline in public interest in nuclear power. Like when you see discussions of the future of energy generation, people generally look at wind power, they look at solar and nuclear is generally treated as this sort of not great path forward. Like Germany recently closed all of its nuclear plants. I think France also closed its nuclear plants. They didn't? Well, so then just Germany. And I know that Britain is starting to build more nuclear plants, right? They just announced that they have a plan to build. Do you, do you, do you know how many by 2035? Well, there's commitment to one and there is discussion <laughs> about several more. Um, Yes, I, I mean it's, it's a very open-ended question. I'm sorry, I don't know that there was a question. All, in there. It's not really the case that that public support for nuclear has de declined since about 1980. It's been fairly steady. Hmm. It did. It, 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 I would say the enthusiasm for it in America led us led to us building something like a hundred nuclear power plants, and those nuclear power plants, by and large, have run since you know, 1970s and early 80s um, and, and, and have generated carbon-free electricity. Nuclear still represents uh, the, the largest non-carbon emitting electricity generating uh, method in America, despite all of the hype about other things. And I don't mean to say that, you know, solar and wind aren't important. They, they I, I support them. I think that it's good to have for us to have them, but it, but it's undoubtedly the case that it would be extremely difficult for them to become a very large part of our energy sources. Um, maybe not impossible, but very difficult. Um, 
Nuclear is something we can turn on and turn off. It's in our control. It's not unlike wind or, or sun, which, you know, the wind doesn't blow most, you know, half the time, and the sun certainly doesn't shine more than half the time on average. Um, and so um, it, it, it's a controllable human resource. And um, it's true that Germany has, has passed laws to abandon um, nuclear power, and uh, they're learning whether or not they can do that. Um, I suspect the, that there may well be change of heart about this. Hmm. But of course... Um, can you elaborate on that? Well, Germany has invested a large amount of uh, money in uh, solar power installations, highly subsidized solar power in installations with promises of extremely high prices for the electricity that they generate. That will be, in the future, more difficult to sustain. And because of the intermittency of, um, of solar and wind power, the, the difficulties of stabilizing the grid will get greater and greater the higher fraction of uh, these intermittent sources one has. So I think that in the end, uh, the wisdom of this decision in Germany um, will be something that the Germans will have to have to decide. I mean, in the meantime, you know, um, in Finland and, and uh, Sweden and so forth, uh, nuclear power remain and France for that matter. Nuclear power remains a very important part of their electricity generating uh, capability. So, 70 to 80 percent of French electricity is generated by nuclear and has been for many decades. Half of Swedish electricity is generated by nuclear and the rest by, by um, um, dam, dams and, and hydro. So um, it's different in different countries. Um, and so we shouldn't really translate the current nervousness about the US um, nuclear future it to necessarily to other countries. So I think it's worth mentioning also the nuclear reactor of today is not quite the nuclear reactor of, you know, our parents' generation. There, there's all sorts of new safety features that I'm constantly seeing rolling out uh, for different containment features in the event of breaches. And we have these thorium processes, which are supposed to be slower and so forth. Do you think that that information has just not really reached the American public or... Why is it that the enthusiasm is sort of lagging in this country? Hmm. Well, some of it, some of the information has reached the American public, and uh, there are many high-profile environmentalists who have changed their mind about nuclear and now think that nuclear is very important hmm. and they advocate for it. Um, the pressure groups, by and large, have not changed their story. You know, the Sierra Club and and, and some of these other advocacy um, organizations and in part it is because you know they're split um, you know some of them realize that nuclear is important but there are others who are dead against nuclear whatever happens and, and part of that let's sentiment is I think uh, understandably driven by you know fear of nuclear weapons of proliferation and so forth um, but anyway so I, I I don't necessarily accept the premise that you know we we're moving away from it. Um, but, but I do think that um, the new safety features um, that a new um, generation of, sorry, uh, didn't mean the pun, a uh, new generation of nuclear reactors um, would, would bring will be important. Um, but in all of these um, situations, there is a trade-off of extra safety or extra hoped for safety uh, against cost. And so it's possible for um, a technology such as nuclear power to be priced out of the market. And, mm. and in America, we, we're very market oriented. We, we, we have this capitalist system where we, we, we like, uh, let the economy make some decisions for us. And so um, if, if, if we keep insisting on more and more safety um, systems, um, then sooner or later, a nuclear will become um, uneconomic mm. in comparison with, let's say, 
cheap uh, fracking of natural gas. Which is ironic because perhaps that's even more unsafe, but the effects would be more, less acute, let's say, and uh, you know, difficult to pin down or something. Uh, yeah, certainly more difficult to pin down. Um, it's certainly the case <laughs> in America at the moment that cheap natural gas is by far the cheapest way of generating electricity. And, and, um, and that's because the price of gas is, in a certain sense, artificially low much lower than it was even 10 or 15 years ago because of fracking mm. that won't that won't last but it but it's part of the way that economics works in this country mm. yeah it's interesting because there's all sorts of uh you know it, it's hard to it's hard to know what what the science is going to play out in the next uh decade or two but there seems to be uh, all sorts of gastrointestinal issues and you know cancer is a huge issue in the in the united states and uh It'll, it'll be interesting how the how the water tables play out uh, with regard to this fracking situation, and you know perhaps the the safety metrics will balance out over time uh, if people grow tired of these hazards. Yeah, um, it's, it's going to be an important question, and um, sooner or later, um, we will have to start uh, taking account economically of the harm we're doing to the atmosphere and to the planet um, in terms of simple things like CO2 emissions. That, it seems to me, is inevitable in, eventually, and that's the right way to make the economic system that we have work uh, to the benefit of all. Unfortunately, it's very unpopular in large fractions of, this, of America and even other European countries to price CO2 emissions uh, equivalent to what they're really going to cost us. Mm. Uh, and until we do that, I think it's, it's going to be um, a difficult argument to make the case that we've got to get rid of CO2 emissions in large measure. Well, the, the interesting sort of corollary to that is that, you know, CO2 emissions are one side of the environmental coin, but there's also just the widespread pollution that isn't as visible as it was during the 1950s, maybe, right? Because you have these images from the 1950s, 60s, and 70s of rivers covered in industrial pollution. R the, the Cuyahoga River lights on fire, I think, 11 times over the course of like 30 years. And it's so obvious to point to, to be able to say that, like, this is a terrible, terrible situation. And now it seems like there's consistently these reports coming out about industrial pollution that are all very disconnected from one another. Like, there isn't one central point that you can look to to say that, you know, this source of industrial pollution is destroying the environment. And yet you see things like, the rubber from car tires is destroying young salmon in rivers, and that's why we don't have spawning anymore. Um, there's various endocrine disruptors that are lowering testosterone, and so we've seen a decrease in testosterone in men over the course of the last 20 years by what, like 40%? Mm. So it's, I think it's 25, but 25%, the, sorry. The, but you're saying like the pricing, uh, the pricing of carbon dioxide is sort of the the first step, but you still have, even if you manage to pull that off somehow, you've got this entire universe of other pollutants that aren't even being registered. Yeah, and it feels like the conversation about nuclear would almost benefit from that as well, because at the very least, it's such a regulated industry in terms of safety, in terms of waste, in terms of what actually gets put out, that it would make more sense to press on all of these other positive aspects of nuclear than just the carbon footprint. But it seems like the carbon footprint is the only concern, or at, least, at the very least, the main concern. What do you make of that? Well, it's certainly the case that nuclear power has such a small amount of um, output of, of, of waste products that is extremely easy in principle, technically easy, not, not politically easy, but te technically easy to manage it. Um, you know, if you were to take all, if you were to take the, take the used um, fuel from all of the um, reactors we've run in America, you know, since fission power began, you could store it all, you know, in, in, a, in a repository that's the size of a couple of football fields and not terribly deep. 
you know, up seven meters deep or something. So we, we have technical designs to take all of the wastes, basically, from nuclear uh, electricity generation and sequester them, keep them away from all people, and it would do no harm to any uh, anywhere else. Hmm. Um, so it's very manageable. Um, and that, as you're pointing out, is, is in a certain sense not the case for many other pollutants, chemical pollutants and so forth. And it's also traceable in a way that most other chemical pollutants are. Like radioactivity oh. is pretty... The traceability of radioactivity is one of its problems because it's extremely easy to detect radioactivity. Um, and as a result, people become alarmed. Mm. But radioactivity is around us all the time. Mm -hmm. And we and we have had this problem that because we, can, we know when, when we're letting out some radioactivity, even if it's tiny, um, you know, the public doesn't really account for the fact that this is, you know, one hundredth of the natural background and therefore it's completely irrelevant. Um, Perhaps more if you live near some of these granite mountains from what I, what I understand. Oh, yeah. The natural background varies by, you know, factors of 10 and 20 from different places on Earth. And I mean, people don't generally take any notice of that whatsoever. So, you know, people are much, much more afraid of radioactivity than is reasonable in, uh, in most situations. Mm -hmm. We expose ourselves to radioactivity and, and uh, radiation damage willingly when we have CT scans or X-rays and or take or flights, we fly, yeah. or we take fly in an airplane, exactly, and we just don't think anything about it. But if someone, you know, hears about there's been a small leak of su of radioactive material from such and such a place, oh, they're all up in arms and so forth. So we're not very good uh, in modern society at um, assessing the relative importance of certain types of risk, and that goes for all different types of pollutants. But just to come back to the CO2 question, I mean, the one, the thing which makes it um, very difficult is, first of all, it's in, in a certain sense undetectable. I mean, it, I mean, it's just carbon dioxide. It's not a pollutant per se. It's only a pollutant when it gets trapped in the atmosphere and, it, and is liable to and is beginning to um, cause global climate change. And that's, and that's the second aspect of it, is that it's global. It's not local. Mm. It's not, you know, a particular um, outlet into a, a river polluting the river, okay? It's, it's the, the, the whole of the globe is uh, enshrouded in this CO2 blanket, which if we inflate its density by, by burning lots of fossil fuels, is going to get serious. Well, I mean, just I, even even if you sort of divorce yourself from the CO two question for a moment, there is this feeling as you drive down the road and you look at the cars on the on the on the highway, or you consider the sort of the material basis of civilization that it feels unbelievably old fashioned. And, and that's perhaps a stupid justification for moving forward technologically, but there's this feeling where you're like, every single one of these cars. I mean, not every single one. Obviously, they're like coming out with electric cars. But there's just this feeling of absurdity that we live in a time where things are so interconnected and we have so much technology, and yet we we explode things inside of engines to do things. Like, it feels absurd. Well, uh, I guess I must be old-fashioned then. Um, <laughs> <laughs> doesn't seem too absurd to... There's um, just a I feeling would... of, like, this is the... Pe like, I imagine that it well, is... how long has it been since the first automobile? Almost no time. I know, really, right? I know. But at the same point, it almost... It's 100 years. <laughs> right, right. And But it feels like being on the verge of, like, the Stone Age to, the like, the first Metal Age a little bit, where you're like, come on, how long have we been doing stone tools? Somebody has got to figure something else out at this point. Well, actually, I mean... If you think about pollution in modern industrial societies, per se, chemical pollution, we've actually done a lot to reduce it in the US and, and in, in Europe, for that matter. So, you know, London used to have these famous pea soup fogs that were produced by particulates that were, jet, were emitted from coal-burning um, power stations predominantly. Mm. And, and it just doesn't anymore. So we've cleaned up the atmosphere in terms of particulates enormously. Actually, China has, had, 
had the same problem in many of its big cities, even, even in the last decade or two, because they initially, as they industrialized, uh, burned coal. And they still are. And so there are pea soup fogs now, you know, in Beijing or in Chengdu and places like that. Um, the Chinese, by the way, recognize that as a big problem. And they are uh, building, rapidly building nuclear power. Um, not, not that they're not doing other things as well, so, um, solar and wind, but they recognize that burning fossil fuels is actually killing millions of people a year um, by virtue of particulates. So we know there are certain types of pollutants that we know that, that are fairly local, that we know how to do something about, although sometimes it's hard to do, to do so, and we've got to replace old-fashioned technologies with new technologies to do it. But we're not doing too badly on almost everything that's local. Mm. On the other hand, what has happened in the last 100 years isn't just that you know, technology has changed, it's that the human population has changed, has changed enormously. You know, when I, when I was born, there were probably only three or four billion people in the world. There are now, you know, eight and going on nine. So we've got, we've seen a total explosion over the last 200 years of the human population. And so the seriousness of pollution this is completely off the topic of energy, but it was <laughs> pollution um, is, 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 is a certain, in a certain sense the product of the number of people and the rate at which each person is generating waste. Mm. Okay? And both of those factors have enhanced enormously over the last one or 200 years. But that seems to be leveling off in the developed world from what I understand. Yeah. Uh, the, I think that population growth in developed countries is by and large under control, but it's under but the population level is probably higher mm. than is going to be easy for us to su sustain. I mean, one of the reasons why it's so difficult to see how we can get the CO2 emission, global CO2 emission levels down to a sustainable level is because, you know, the number of uh, the number of people. If we want the whole, if we want 8 billion people to achieve a standard of living comparable to, let's say, the US, then we have to reduce the average per capita um, fossil fuel usage or CO2 emission uh, level to about 1% of what is currently the American CO2 per capita uh, emission level. So is oh, that like thorium? Is that like thorium reactors in every car? And just, just ground the U.S. military for a week, and you could probably cut it in half. Because right, because I mean, like I look at it from the perspective where it's like, yeah, there's a lot of people in the world, but the develop the the job of the developed world at this point is to basically figure out the technologies that are necessary to create a sustainable world, and then to also bring those technologies without the like you know, the history of violence and, and takeover to people in order to actually make a world that's functional. But then you get into all kinds of weird other stuff where it's like paternalism and, you know, do as I say, not as I do. And again, you've talked about the markets and who owns the technologies and who gets to make money off of those technologies. And so it's not... Well, it strikes me that most, of, you know, the consumers often get blamed for these things, but most, most of the users are industrial or military. And so uh, I, I'm a little skeptical of, of thinking that it's the average person, you know, driving their car that's really doing this to us. Well, these are social things about which I'm not an expert. That's fair. No that's worries. Right. But, let me, but let me comment on one question you've raised a couple of times, and that's the question of thorium, uh, which is a technical nuclear question. So <laughs> it is possible to use thorium, thorium as a fuel for fission reactors. And in fact, um, this, this has been done. Uh, it has been done in India for one reason predominantly, and that is that for many decades, India was unable to obtain uranium because it, it had violated the various international agreements mm. um, and developed its own weapons. 
And you can just so, scoop thorium out of the ocean if that. Well, it turns out India has plenty of thorium, and they have no uranium. Mm. Okay, there isn't there isn't more uh, thorium on Earth than uranium. There, it's about the same amount. Mm. Okay, so in terms of um, ultimate fuel resources, thorium doesn't replace uranium. It probably just doubles the total amount. If we and if we want to, uh, in the long run, we could use thorium instead of uranium. Um, thorium has very few practical advantages and, and certainly has some economic, slight economic disadvantages relative to uranium in terms of the technology that uh, is required to produce electricity from it. But so, it, so thorium, despite, you know, some of the fictional portrayals of uh, its importance, is interesting and in the long term so certainly might be useful but it is not you know, going to transform fission energy. It is not you know, the magic bullet that is going to make um, fission energy uh, somehow acceptable and desirable in a way that it currently is. But is it safer? Does it, does it uh, you know, I don't know if this is the right terminology, does it burn slower? Or is there some, some wind of not that? Not particularly, that not particularly. The main dangers in a fission reaction, as I mentioned earlier, are the afterheat of... Uh, fission products and thorium has fission products it's, and they're not the same necessarily mm. fission products as uranium but but it's it it has to tackle many of the same problems as mm. as as uranium so if if I, if we can change directions slightly something that you know this all centers around is the idea of how do we know these things right which is the fact that we ask these questions scientifically and we search for the answers and we have a society that is very focused on being able to answer questions in a scientific way because we have decided that that is the best possible way to the answer questions. Reliable, the yeah. most reliable way. But you have kind of written about scientism and the fact that science has limits. Do you think that that applies to the question of nuclear power or is that a completely different bin of... Of sort of of thought for you. Well, first of all, um, scientism, as as I mean it, and most people mean it, is the idea that essentially all the real knowledge uh, that one can get is obtained scientifically. That science is all the real knowledge there is. Um, this is not something that is widely um, claimed, uh, although sometimes it is claimed by the extreme. But it is something that is widely believed or at least um, acted on in that way. And, um, and so that's what scientism is. Um, I've written basically repudiating scientism. I don't think scientism is true. I think it's pernicious uh, to think that all of the human knowledge is based on science because science is incompetent to understand and, and investigate certain types of things. And the sorts of examples that I use are things like history. So sci you don't use scientific techniques, by and large, um, to, uh, to study history. You use documents, you use uh, various different uh, witnesses and so forth. And in general, what it's a misunderstanding of what science is, at least the way I understand what science is, uh, to think that science can possibly um, be all the knowledge there is. Science is, is based on reproducible experiments or observations, and it requires a certain crisp um, uh, clarity of expression um, in order to be able to tell whether you've got reproducible results from experiments or observations. And some aspects of uh, of our knowledge of our of things that are important to humans don't have either that reproducibility or that crispness and, clar and clarity. They 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 are ambiguous. Um, the answers aren't clear, um, or they're simply unique, and and um, you know you can't go back and try it again. Um, so does that? Do you think that that's a uh, does that apply to sort of natural history as well? Like. You talked about, I assume you're talking about human history for the most part here, but, but of course, like we can't go back and repeat the ice ages. We can't go back and repeat the formation of the solar system. Um, do you sort of bend those together with, with history or? Well, 
That's a good question, and it's one that's often often asked. The answer is science can study some things about the past. In fact, science knows perfectly well, for example, that the universe is 13.8 billion years old. The Earth is, you know, four or five billion years old. Um, it, and we know, and we, and speaking of ice ages and so forth, we can document the past more than a million years for how the climate has changed. And we do that by drilling cores into, into the ice in, in Antarctica and then studying uh, the trapped um, gases that are in that core that come from different ages. So science is very much able to study the past, but what it can't um, really address is human history. Is is the because history, as commonly understood, is is about you know power struggles and wars and and politics and societies, squishy and so, things, metaphysical squishy concepts, things, yeah, like, <laughs> right? squishy intentions, things, like. yes. and and they don't possess either the clarity or the reproducibility that science requires. So. There are some things about the past that we can learn from science, but there are other very important things about this, the past that we can't learn from science and that require different types of disciplines. And, there, and almost everything about human societies is not of the same type that the natural sciences um, uh, require hmm. to, um, to understand. And so when... As I said earlier, I'm not an expert in society, and I'm and I and I make no claims about that. And I don't think that any scientist, uh, natural scientist like myself, um, can can take seriously the idea that you know we would use science in in, in the way that na- na- we mean by natural science to understand human society. Um, and I think that trying to imagine that we can turn sociology and economics and, and uh, political science and so forth into sciences um, of the same type as the natural sciences is futile. These are disciplines that have approaches to their study that are totally different from the, from the disciplines that we use in the natural sciences, which, and those natural sciences are what underlies um, engineering and technology, okay, um, and, and, and those other disciplines, the non-scientific disciplines, are different. But that doesn't mean they don't have any knowledge. I mean, there's very important knowledge in those areas. But just to finish this thought, technology, by and large, requires reproducibility. And that's why technology and the natural sciences, which depend on reproducible experiments and observations, are so closely linked. Um, but technology is not the be-all and end-all, um, even though I, I'm at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. <laughs> yeah, don't let them hear you I say that. There are, I think there are other things that are just as important. Well, it seems that the sort of the logical end to this would be to find ways to integrate these sorts of questions about society into the study and pursuit of science and technology. Right. Because I constantly ask the question of, you know, if we can, does it mean that we should? And I think that that's a question that science can't answer because it's almost this dynamo that develops under its own inertia where you you see this all of the time. You know, there's there's just this movement forward of progressively increasing technological ability of pushing science into things like gene therapies and cloning and these these massive Physical manipulations. Physical manipulations of the natural world. And it's hard to see people stopping to ask those soft questions of, what does this mean? Sure, I can get money for it and I can get a grant to study it, but should I? There's no space in the academy really to ask those questions. And I've, I've been in positions where I've, you know, I, I worked in a laboratory that was developing... Uh, neural shanks to implant into animal brains to control neurons. And on one level, you can... To control behavior. To control behavior in the long run. And there's one way that you can look at it and you're like, well, this is great. I'm sure that this is going to be medical technology one day. But it's also funded by the U.S. Army. And so you're like, well, that's probably not necessarily going to be a purely medical technology. And there's not a conversation of, should we be doing this work? Because there's money on the table. 
And the money on the table basically erases the question of should we do this? There might be agreement, in a widespread agreement, that we should ask those questions and that we should listen to the answers. I, I, I mean, I'm a Christian, so I have certain moral imperatives that I consider are placed upon me and on, on, on all humans um, that basically uh, would, would influence decisions about matters such as those you were just discussing. And so I think moral and ethical decisions are agreed to be important by most people, but the problem is that we don't know how to um, bring them to bear in a way um, that will have the kind of weight applied to them that we think they should. I mean, one reason why we don't have those mechanisms is that by and large, people don't agree on what the ethical priorities are. So one of the beautiful things, if you like, about science is that because of its reliance on reproducibility and uh, clarity, we, we can come very quickly to agreement on you know, scientific discoveries, whether we think they're true or not. I mean, it's, it's imperfect, it may take time, but, com but relative to other questions, moral or ethical questions, for example, um, there's a widespread agreement within the sci scientific community about many of these things quite quickly. Um, the same is not true uh, on, in areas of ethics, but certainly I would argue that um, science ought to be influenced, some, some, sometimes constrained or even restrained from uh, doing certain types of things by other um, aspects of our humanity, including ethics and religion and so forth. Is, is that because there's just not the same institutional venue for those discussions? Is, is you know, over, over the past hundred years or so, um, we've really seen the departure of religion uh, from even the academy, right? A lot of the original academic structures were very closely knit um, with the church and had sort of this moral framework that they evolved from, really, originally. What do you see being the remediation for that going forward? Well, the secularization of universities in the West has taken place very thoroughly. And um, now many people um, are hesitant even to raise religious questions. And as a consequence, are sometimes um, reticent to raise certain types of moral questions. But I would say there is... You know, we haven't actually banished um, moral commitments un and, and in many respects unfounded moral commitments um, from our universities. So all we've done is changed what, you know, the, the priorities are. Mm. Um, so so in, in American universities, there's all kinds of ideological um, uh, enforcement going on but it's like a subtext right it's not like an actual declarative discussion to those ends in a forum that's, yeah that, that's what makes it even worse mm, exactly it, it's not even being debated right um you know the, the moral compulsions of the current um society uh particularly in academia are not actually being factually discussed because mm. we've we've lost in ma in many respects we've lost the ability uh, to have a cordial discussion about priorities. That's one of the greatest, I mean, people sometimes ask me, I've been in the universities a long time, you can probably tell. Um, people ask me, how has a place like MIT or the university generally changed in the last 40 years? Well, one thing that's changed is it's far more difficult to have cordial and respectful discussions about hard problems. In the, in the modern university than it was even 40 years ago. Um, and that's a bit major problem. You, you might have heard um, that someone was re just a week or so ago disinvited from giving a talk at MIT because they had questioned uh, one of the pet ideologies of American um, academia at some other universities. It had nothing to do with the talk that that person was invited to give, and he was unlikely to have even raised the question. Mm. But because of a Twitter mob, he was basically disinvited. I think that's a very 
troubling development to me. Yeah, it seems like the worst thing that could happen is that these conversations get closed out and then they happen, you know, sort of amongst folks who all agree with one perspective in these tiny little silos somewhere. And and by not having these public discussions, it's really endangering the outcome of those discussions um, or the actions that could result from, from them might be quite hazardous. Well, the extent to which we can have hard discussions, you know, as a society as a whole is puzzling altogether to me. Um, and I think these bear on technological questions as well as on societal questions. And so, you know, I think that we, concerning, for example, nuclear power, uh, we're at a certain place where there are certain ideologues um, about uh, nuclear power and, and all things nuclear um, who aren't interested in having more discussions, but just are, have, a, have a decisive position that they've adopted. I think it's very hard for uh, humans to be fully rational about many things. Um, but I do think it's terribly important for us to be able to have thoughtful, cordial, respectful uh, discussions and not to, to be in this mode of, of just basically dissing people on the, on the, on the basis of narrow mindedness. Do you have any pulse on what the, like, what sort of solutions are available to the humans in the future? Is there a way to open up those channels? Is there an alternative venue? Um, I know you're a proponent of probably, I, I, I assume you're a proponent of traditional religious institutions. Do you see that as the way forward? Or do you think that there's an alternative? Uh, how, how will humans learn to talk about these things out in the open again? Or is it just going, you know, or is it, do you, do you have a, a less optimistic view of the future? That's a good question. I have a very optimistic view of the future, but my my optimism is not based on uh, human ability. It's ba it's based on my belief that God is in control ultimately, and that um, and that and that if we if we recognise that, then we will we will find that there are uh, ways forward. Um, I don't have solutions for all of these problems that I that we've been discussing and and. Um, this issue of respectful conversation and, and tackling the hard problems in a public way is a particularly difficult one. I don't know that the church has necessarily always been successful in doing that. Um, uh, you know, it often hasn't. Uh, but I do think that, that the church foundation of universities, as you pointed out, with most colleges prior to, certainly prior to 1800, was, were begun by religious organizations, um, I think that shows that there is a certain, um, I don't know, tendency amongst uh, pe Christian people uh, to put, put high value on e education, on um, character formation, and uh, the kinds of things that are, in a certain sense, religious values. And I do think we need those types of values in our society. I mean, that's ultimately what we need. And um, it, as long as those kinds of discussions are banished because, you know, people don't agree very easily about them, I think that uh, it's, it's, rather, it's, you know, it's not, not, things are not looking good. So, uh, again, not an expert on the social side, sorry. Do you think that plasma physics has a moral component? Uh, no, I don't really think that it has a moral component, but I do think that um, that, that moral and ethical demands um, or priorities uh, have an influence on the discipline and should have an influence on the discipline. So, I mean, one of the reasons why uh, I got into plasma physics was a desire to benefit humankind, okay? I mean, uh, it wasn't... For me to make money, I just think that energy is important and it's benef bringing its benefits in a way that is sustainable and so forth is something that I would, you know, I feel proud of being a part of. Um, and uh, so, so I think that those kinds of ethical considerations are actually a part of many of my colleagues' thinking about plasma physics and fusion. And I don't just mean, you know, 
religious people. I mean, I, I think that can be true of secular people too, that, they, that they're motivated by things that come from outside the discipline. I mean, yes, there is an internal integrity to a scientific discipline, which says that he, here are some of the challenges the next discoveries need to resolve these questions and so on and so forth. But at the same time, there are things from outside the, the importance of society or ethics or demands or restrictions or constraints or whatever they might be. Uh, and I think that's, those are, those should be part of the story. Do you think that that, the way that, you know, the, your story of being motivated to actually make the world a better place, it, it might be, I don't know, I, I assume that it's not entirely uncommon within the engineering uh, world. Do you think that the, you know, seeing some of those changes come about in one's career, do you think that it drives scientism within uh, those institutions? Or do you think that scientism is a bigger problem for the public at large? Uh, I think scientism as a whole is a, is a much wider problem than just academia. I, uh, I, I think that I think we've, we've now reached the point where, for example, um, so much of the media coverage of topical questions is um, is based on we've done a poll and we show that fifty six percent of the people think this and you know thirty percent. So polling is a sort of pseudo scientific way mm. of taking the opinion of um, the the society about the particular question. A reason I say it's pseudo scientific is. It, it's far from clear what polls mean. Mm -hmm. You know, we know we know that the way questions are asked can determine the outcome and so forth. And so <coughs> that's just one evidence, excuse me, <coughs> of the of the desire and the intention in society as a whole as, as to use kind of scientific techniques to come up with answers that are more persuasive. Mm. Um, but the truth of the matter is, um, you know, a lot of the treatment of statistics in, in, uh, in our discussion socially and about the news media and so forth are more deceptive than they are revealing. Mm -hmm. I mean, basically, it, it's just it, it has, has become a sort of rhetorical technique that we simply cite some um, statistics to back up the, the thing we thought about ahead of time. So I so so truthfully, scientism has far more influence across the board in society than most people imagine. Um, but it but it you know shows up in in some ways that one can detect in the trends of things. Um, I think that you know people have to gain the ability to make sen sensitive and sensible evaluations of evidence and that is a very subtle question mm. uh, and it's not something that you can you know produce an algorithm to do mm -hmm. it's it's something that we should be inculcating through our education systems both in high school and um, at, at the tertiary level yeah it's like something you just need experience like it just takes reps and i don't know so i thought i saw a really interesting study on twitter which i don't necessarily know the details of because i didn't read it too closely yet but uh the summary was the fact that they had given a it was a group of researchers that had generated a data set and they gave it to a bunch of different laboratories and asked them to evaluate what the data said and they literally found a total spread of outcomes from the laboratories, from finding enormous effects to finding no effects to finding enormous effects in the opposite direction from the same data set among highly educated, very, very well-trained scientists, statisticians, etc. And so I'm very sort of I'm I'm wary about this idea that it's possible to come to an objective final measurement of something and then have everybody agree, even when they look at the same data. We actually we did we just finished an episode about this, where it's like mathematics is used in order to demonstrate what is real, but then you look at the mathematics and you realize that depending on how you apply the mathematics, you can kind of shift what is real in many, many cases. Well, how you parameterize something. Or yeah, something exactly. Like and so, 
I don't recall who it was that used to say there are lies, damned lies, and statistics. I, I want to say, wasn't that Mark Twain? I want to say, all good quotes Twain. of Mark Twain. I think it was Mark Twain. <laughs> Well, that seems that seems like a good a place to end. You, you actually bear a certain likeness to Mark Twain now that I think about it. <laughs> <laughs> I can see that. But uh, yeah, Dr. Hutchinson, we've taken a lot of your time today. It's been really fascinating to talk to you, and we would love to meet up again in the future. What are you working on right now? Do you have any more books coming out, or or what sort of projects are you getting into? What's exciting? The projects I've been working on uh, recently in the last year or two actually have mostly been plasma. Uh, problems that are relevant to space uh, plasmas. There are lots of uh, satellites that have been uh, sent up to study what is sometimes called space weather, but it, but basically it's the it's the way that the plasmas are behaving in the vicinity of the Earth and and in the solar system and so forth. Mm. And the problems that I've been studying uh, and publishing on uh, are to do with non the nonlinear behavior of plasmas in those types of situations. So it's been a terrific, uh, terrifically interesting development in my career that I've, you know, reached the point of, of bringing some of the knowledge that I've gained by studying fusion and, and, and applied it to something that's totally different. Mm. Well, excellent. We'll, we'll use that as a starting point for episode two. Okay. Uh, yeah, where can folks find you? Is the best place to uh, stay up on your on your research just through your website at MIT, or or do you? Yeah, do you, you can track me. You can track me down through MIT, or you can Google me, and you'll find you'll find Ian Hutchinson. Um, and um, excellent. Do you participate in any Twitter mobs? I I don't use social media almost at all. Uh, I don't do Twitter or Facebook, and I think they're a little bit pernicious. <laughs> You know, it's funny, we keep having the most fascinating conversations with people that have absolutely no social media presence, which I think is well, I, just... Well, it's a privilege. presence, but not social media presence. Fair enough. Well, keep it up. You're, you're among the lucky few. Okay. All right. Thank you, Dr. Hutchinson. All right. All right. Goodbye. Take care. Thank you so much. Bye. <laughs>